So you'll see that there is weekly seven, weekly quiz seven is out there before weekly quiz seven, six ended. So, um, and then assignment seven is also out there. Here's what I'm going to suggest you do. Um, do the weekly quiz first before your assignment. Get the feedback. So there's auto feedback. You'll get your results immediately. Use that feedback for your assignment because there are similar types of questions and it's just a good way to build some habits. Your quiz is worth a lot less than an assignment. It's half or less of the points. So, um, so do that first. Okay. So onward, we march to counting. So today we're just covering still the basics of counting. Um, and there's a few pieces. Let's see if I have a pen here. Um, so first we're going to go over some basic counting rules and you'll see that they're noted in this little box. That's because there is a sum rule, a subtraction rule, a multiplication rule, a product rule, and a division rule. And these are just the ways that we're going to deal with elements in the sets of things that we're interested in, how we're, we can add them together, take the product of them, etc. Then we're going to look at a bunch of examples and that's kind of throughout. Okay, and finally at the end we're going to look at how tree diagrams can be really useful in in these types of counting. Okay, so the first rule is the product rule and this can be used for any procedure that can be broken down into a sequence of tasks. So um, if you're writing a program and there are X ways that you can do the first half of the program that lead into the next sequence of steps in which there are Y ways to accomplish that second task, then overall you can just look at the product of those counts. So if I have X ways to do step one, Y ways to do step two, then to complete the whole procedure is just X times Y. Okay, which makes sense. And we'll see examples. So for those of you that like concrete examples, that's coming, don't worry. Uh, what about when we're counting um, sequences? So we've, we continually are applying this to, to sets, sets of information, sets of, um, and we also can think of the Cartesian product of sets. So that sequence um, built up uh, of elements from a set A and a set B. So if we're looking at uh, the number of elements that would be within a possibly within a sequence built from all of those elements in a set A and all of the elements in a set B, then that's just A times B. So it's all the count, the, the cardinality of that set A times the cardinality of set B. And this kind of makes sense, right? Like if you think, well, it does make sense. Um, but if I, if I say that I've got a set A, which contains the numbers one and two, and I have a set B containing um, A, B, C. Oops. Um, there's a delay, so that's a Cartesian product. Then what happens if we're creating this set, then we're gonna find every mapping, the Cartesian product you'll remember is every possible combination of elements from set one with elements from set two. So one A, one B, 1c, 2a, 2b, 2c. So that's, those would all exist, right? We'd have a 1a, a 1b, a 1c, etc. And that would be what is made up, uh, what is a part of this, this set, a cross b. And, and so we can break that down by saying, and the reason it, if I go backwards, the reason that looks like this, where I said a procedure that can be broken down into a sequence of two tasks, right? Well, the, the sequence of two tasks are this. First, I choose an element from A. There's two ways to do it, right? Or the size of my set A. Second, I choose an element from B and I have three ways to do that in this case, but it's the cardinality of that set B. And so for that reason, um, I have two times three or six possible ways that I can combine them. Okay. So
So, um, so let's take a look at an example of applying the product rule. First, I need to. Okay, so, so here is a question. Um, how many bit strings of late length eight are there? And now why is this an example hint? It's an example of the product rule. Yeah, so Adam says two to the eighth. In fine style, carrying on right through week 11, <laughs> first to answer, I love it. Um, so Adam, uh, or anyone else that's that's has come to the same conclusion, um, why is it that it's two to the eighth, and why does the product rule apply? Anybody is free to mic up in this environment. Or type. Up to you. Because each bit has two possible values, and we have eight possible or like values in our array that a bit could take up. So it's eight, eight versions of it. Perfect. Exactly. So, so in this sense, where we had a sequence of steps before we said, okay, well, we can break it down into two, but this is breaking it down even further. In fact, for every single bit, we can decide, we've got those, those eight choices to make. And each one, I'm gonna choose between a zero and a one, right? And so to that end, I have two choices at each step of the game. And for that reason, there's two to the eight. So we can consider each bit. So anytime you, you have a problem like this, um, counting problems are best done by breaking it down. Um, as I should say, are, as Brent will affirm, um, all programming assignments, anything that you do in computer science, if it feels like too big of an ask, like especially right now, you're probably working on some of your last assignments in 1110 and 1105, if it seems too hard, uh, what you have to do is break it down a little further. Um, and that's what, um, I mean, really, that's where discrete math is trying to come into all of that and saying, okay, here's, take a closer look, right? Look a little bit closer in and see if you can break it down. So it's really easy if I had initially asked, if anyone didn't jump immediately to two to the eighth, if I first said, well, consider each bit, how many choices do I have for that one bit? You'd say, oh, I can count that, two right? Zero or one. Uh, and so, so then because of the product rule, we can say, well, actually I'm making a sequence of choices throughout. I'm choosing a zero or a one, then a zero or a one, and a zero or a one. And so my answer becomes two to the eighth. Okay. So let's take it to another uh, level. And that is how many different postal codes can be made? If each contains a sequence of uppercase English letters, so the A to Z, I'll give you a hint. There are 26. Oops, I can't write it, but there are 26. Followed by the digits 0 to 9 to form our postal code format. So it's going to be a letter, number, letter, number, letter, number. Samiksha. Perfect. Okay, so let's take a look. So we've got an answer given which is 26 times 10 times 26 times 10 times 26 times 10. Exactly, because we can break it down just as we did before to say first I choose letter one, then I'm gonna choose letter two, then three, uh, sorry, number, the number in the second place, the letter in the third place, the number in the fourth place, the letter and the number and so on. And so um, we had 26 choices for each of the letters and we've got 10 choices for each of the digits. Um, remember that zero, that'll get people every time. And that becomes this, this big mess of a thing, um, which is 17,576,000 possibilities. Okay, so what if we want, um, yeah, we're gonna get to, to that as well, which is di different. We're gonna get to permutations and combinations um, for now, we're going to start with the counting basics. So we're just doing the simple rules, okay? And and this first assignment that you have is from last class. It's just the counting basics. Okay, so how many functions are there uh, from a set with m elements to a set with n elements? So we have a function from a set 
and this contains m elements and we're going to move it to a set with n elements so how many we've got some function f and it's going to go from this one set to the next so how do we think about that So we have a few guesses. Um, essentially, we're going to choose some x in here and map it to some y, right? So we're going to have to pick a way to go from f of x to a y. So what that means is for every possible x in here, we're going to have to find a place for it to go. Okay. So we can think about each choice. So let's, let's first think about this, this one X. Okay. So this one value, this one element for my first set, there are M of them, but this is, this is my first little X I, there are M of them. Okay. How do I know where this one's going? Or how many choices do I have to make about where it could go? Yeah, so we're going from the domain to the codomain. Yeah, so there are n elements in here, right? So I have n possible choices. Now, how many times do I have to make that choice? This is where the product rule comes in. So I'm going to say I have x1, and it's going to go over to some y1, right? And I have n choices there. And then I have x2, and it's going to go to some y2. And I have a certain number of choices I can make there. But for every xi, I'm going to send it somewhere to yi in the other set. And for each of those, you said I have n choices. Oops, n choices. And how many of these do I have? I have m of them. I have to make that n times. So what does the product rule say? Is it the same as m times n? Does anybody want to challenge? We rarely get to challenge Adam. Um, anybody want to challenge Adam on this one? He's challenging himself now. This is fun. <laughs> Sorry, you're a very good sport. And, and you're often right, so um, to be fair. Anybody else want to challenge this answer? So I see I see a few answers, m to the n. So generally, I'd stop things and say, well done, if I agreed. Anna, prize to you. Um, so I notice, Anna, that you've flipped this. And Trent did as well. OK, yeah. So the reason that there's a flip there is we're going to make this choice um, of the first one, which is n. And then the product comes in the next time we're going to make another choice. So for x2, we're going to make a choice where it's going to go, right, to some y2. Um, and there are n possible choices that we could make for that second one. And so we're going to do that m times. Um, so I'll put in the notes. Um, so since the function represents a choice of one of the n elements, right, that we came up with in the codomain, for each of the m elements in the domain, the product rule tells us that we're just going to take, we have n choices for the way that we take the first element, x1. We have n choices for where to take x2, n choices for where to take x3, and so on. So there are n to the m uh, functions. Well done. Uh, you know what? It's not my pen. I, I, I do agree. This is so frustrating. I, I think they should just get me a whole new set of everything because look, it's the old style. Um, but I, that is a super first world problem and um, I'm very happy for what I have. Okay. I think it's just a leg. 
Uh, I do agree with that. I think I need better internet connectivity. <laughs> okay, so they can't fix that. That's on me. Okay, so so now we're going to take it one step further. How many one-to-one -one functions are there? Okay, so now I know I'm connecting a bunch of dots, right? We're playing with sets. We're playing with functions. We're playing with counting. Um, but that's that's the point, is that all of this does tie together. And, and um, if functions feel a bit vague, sometimes that's we're trying to find different ways that we can connect things. So um, if you're working with data sets, large data sets in computer science, um, oftentimes you're trying to look through the different options. Well, how many how many options are we looking through? Sometimes we need to know. So what if I only want to look through the, the number of one-to-one -one functions? And we're going to stick with the same setup where uh, we have M options the, in the first one and N options in the second. I'm going to give you a hint, okay? And because you might be thinking, wah, if you remember what one-to-one -one is, um, you might be thinking, okay, well, I know. So actually, does anybody want to tell me what one-to-one -one is? If I have an, an element in M, what do I know about it? Each of them are going to go somewhere, right, in this other set, into the domain. So everything in the codomain is going to go into the domain. And it's only, the, nothing else, you're not going to see anything like um, like this. There's no one else coming into that, that uh, element. So if I have an f of a equals b, no other element um, is coming into b. Okay? So what you know about that is this. If m, uh, we know that this must be smaller than or equal to n because otherwise, we have a problem. If M is bigger than N, what would happen? Like if, if somehow I had it, if, if there was one bigger than N out here, if this was, if this was bigger, then I would run out of elements. So this cannot be bigger than, uh, this cannot be uh, bigger than N. All right. So I think I see no two elements in one to one correspond to the same element exactly. Okay, so suppose um, that we have elements in our um, codomain. So again, we've got these x1, x2, all the way to the xm. Okay, so how many choices are there for the first one? This is one way to think about it. How many choices do I have for that first mapping over to my domain? Well, I'm assuming that n is bigger than or equal to n. So, so actually the thing that's driving this is the size of my domain. Right, so essentially what I'm saying is I have uh, n elements over here. So here's n, uh, y, n, y, 1, y, 2, y, 3. I have all the way down, I have n of these. So I have to pick one of them, don't I? So I have to pick some place for this x1 to map to. So how many choices from this set, the domain, do I have? N, yeah, see so here, well spotted. Um, and so the first one, so for this guy, I can choose N different elements. How about for the second one? So now I've chosen one, let's just call it, we'll just always say it's Y1, but it could be any element in the set. Yeah, so now I can no, I can no longer choose Y1, can I? So now, for the second one, I only have n minus 1 choices. Perfect. How about x3? n minus 2, yeah. 
Now, here's always the tricky bit when you think about counting. Where does this stop? And actually, you're probably thinking about this right now when you're writing programs and you're saying, I want to go from, from uh, into r equals 1 to what? What is this? n minus what? This is where we can run into those off by one errors, right? When you're looping through arrays. So we're close at n minus 1, at n minus m. But if you'll note, when i was 1, it was n minus 0. When i was 2, xi, uh, when i was 2, it was n minus 1. And so we really want n minus m plus 1. Yeah, nice, Brayden. Okay. And so let's see, uh, oops, I can put that up. Oh, that was a delay. There we go. So supposing we used X, but whatever, um, in the, oh, in the domain we used Y, we had, uh, that's an N. Um, so if we had, we used y, uh, because I don't follow this. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so I used y in my example, but so we had elements in the codomain, a1 to an. There are n ways to choose from those. So for the first value of a1, we had n ways. So that was our n. And we could do that in isolation. And it doesn't matter the order that we did it, as long as we keep track of what we're doing, because we're simply counting. If we chose that differently, we would have had different choices later on. So it doesn't, actually, this is where later we're going to get to times that it matters, the order that you do things. Um, when we get to permutations and combinations, we'll see that we talk about order differently. Uh, but in this example, it doesn't matter which uh, arbitrary element we mapped first. Okay, so for the second one, we had n minus 1 choices, then n minus 2, all the way down to n minus m plus 1. So we would calculate what that is, and that depends on the size of these sets. Okay? So let's take an example then that we can actually work with. So we've got uh, telephone numbers. You've all probably got a telephone number right there with you. And in um, North America, there's a format that was used a long time ago um, where if we look at this, um, we're going to let, in our example, we're going to let A be 0 or 1. And, and so in my example here, A can be 0 or 1. And B can represent the digits 2 through 9. And X can be any digit, 0 through 9. Okay, So they're called the, the area code, the office code, the station code. Anyway, these are what create those numbers. Right? In North America, telephone numbers before the 1970s used an older format. And what that was, was BAX, BBX, XX, XX. So that means that first digit could be any number um, 2 through 9, right? And then it could start off, these guys here could be 2 through 9, and then all the rest of them could be any digit. Okay? so. Um, you can see an example, like 902 is the, the Halifax area code that fits that, right? However, you might note there are new area codes that don't have that. You may have one. I have a cell phone that doesn't start with 902. It's the 782 number because they ran out of numbers. Um, and so it's that's still a Halifax. It's a Nova Scotia cell phone number. Um, and so we would not have had that number under the old format because that 8 would not have existed. But you'll see here, um, when they needed more uh, numbers, um, they what they did was they added that ability to include that. And so we went to BXX, BXX, XXX. Okay, so, so my question to you, and I really want you to think about it, is how many different telephone numbers are possible under the old format and then under the new format? And... Yeah, it's a good question, Adam. Why didn't they use just all the digits straight off? Um, I don't know. Um, but I'll tell you this. I, I had a lot of great jobs right around 2000. Um, 
probably about the year you were born, um, when, um, during Y2K, there was a huge craziness. And you might have heard of Y2K from your parents, but um, people thought things would shut down and things would have. Because essentially, they didn't think ahead that they would ever roll past the year 1999. And so there was assumption that all years started with 19 when programs were made. And they couldn't move to 2000. Um, and so paychecks would have been written as 1900 and not cashable. Um, just a thousand and one iterations. Time would have just gone backwards um, in calculations. It was, it was uh, a great fun time to be a programmer because there were a lot of weird problems that were inflicted because they didn't think ahead. Um, yeah, and so the, the one is for the long distance as well. Yeah. Yeah, Bates were loving that. Okay, so, so I want you to think about what that looks like. And so I'm going to give you a start of that solution, okay? The, uh, the old format is BAX, and so I'll just remind you that B is 2 to 9. Whoa, I'll try to remind you. 2 to 9. A is a 0 or 1. And X is all the digits, okay? So... I would say break it down, then break it down, then break it down. So how many different ways are there to do, and you don't have to come up with the number, just give me the product of things that you're going to do. This is applying the product rule. How many ways are there to do BAX? I can first choose my a, B. I can then choose my A. I can then choose my X. And here's the careful, careful, uh, careful everyone. Um, Burnley, I see 7 times 2 times 10. That's very close. Um, but it'll be off by, by a bit. Yeah. So 8 times 2 times 10. Exactly. And the reason I say be very careful when you're counting the number of options in there. It's really easy. Um, you're actually always subtracting one less than it. So it's really 9 minus 1. Um, it's tempting to be 9 minus 2. Uh, so, it, and it's easier to count here. But when you get working with bigger numbers, that can it's easy. So there's 8 times 2 times 10, or 160 area codes. Um, BBX, there's 8 choices for B, 8 choices for B, 10 choices for X. So there's 8 times 8 times 10, or 640 station codes. XXXX, it's 10 to the 4th, right? Um, and so, um, and then finally, and so I say that's already enough to figure out what this is. But the only other value that we're missing is BXX. So we'll just grab that one. And that is um, 8 times 10 times 10, or 800 area codes. Yeah, so Mackenzie, you've got an exam and a thing. It's what number did you come up with? You can check your answer. That's 160 times 640 times 10,000. Um, will give us the value for the number of numbers under the old format. And under the new format, it's going to be 800. So this is the 800 times 800. Oops, there's no point writing fast. Times um, 10 to the fourth. Um, and that's six, oh, it's, sorry, I said 1 million. It's 1 billion 24 million for the old format. And it's six billion four hundred million for the the new one. So that's um, that's a lot more numbers, right? And some of you are probably thinking ahead, very Y two K minded. Um, why stop at B for the first two? <laughs> um, and there might be reasons that I'm not aware of. Uh, I have no idea where those numbers lie. It could be that they're already accounted for. Like maybe, I, I have no idea, to be honest. Okay, so if we want to count subsets of a finite set, um, we can also use the product rule. So um, we can show that um, a number of different subsets, so we've got a finite set, and we want to say um, how many subsets are there of this finite set. Essentially, the idea is, and the reason it's two to the something, is you've got a bunch of different elements in here. And the idea is for any, um, any subset, you're basically um, working in binary. It's either in it or it's not. Um, and so that's, that's the concept. I'm going to skip over this a little bit. But 
So when the elements of a set are listed in some arbitrary order, so I list out all the elements in my set, um, x1, x2, um, and we say those are arbitrary elements in the set, then there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between subsets um, and bit strings of length uh, of length s. Because essentially what we're saying is it's either in the set or it's not. Okay, and so by the product rule, we already did that with bit strings. The lazy way of solving any type of counting problem is to map it to something else. And so um, to that end, when we were talking about uh, whether or not the even numbers were infinite, and, and I'm not going to test you on transfinite anything. Um, and so I, as I mentioned, that was kind of a fun day to step into counting and start thinking about what it means to, to map to counting. Um, but the lazy way to approach counting things in infinity is that you find something that you can map a one-to-one -one relationship. Because if I can say that I have exactly the same number of elements, I have a one-to-one -one function that goes from this example to another, that means I have the exact same number in each, right? Um, and so this is, that's the lazy way. It's a great way. I like, uh, oops, I don't know what that is. Um, okay, that was my crazy, I cleaned it up and I didn't delete it. All right, so the product rule with respect to sets can be exaggerated. And we've already done this, um, but essentially you can do the same thing. The task of choosing something um, from, uh, we looked at A cross B, but you can expand that, right? So if you're choosing um, from one task, then a second bucket, then a third bucket, then a fourth bucket, um, you're still looking at that, that product of the number of elements for each task. Okay, so on to the, the second rule of counting, which is the sum rule. So sometimes you have a procedure that can be broken down into two possible ways of doing something, and neither of those ways overlap. So this is different than saying uh, a task where you have to do one thing and then the next thing, so a sequence of events, which is why a sequence is a nice way to model that. Sometimes what you have is there's two possible ways to do something, right? And I know how to count um, this one option, and I know how to count this other option, and I know there's, there's they, these options don't overlap, okay? So if a task can be done in one of, of, uh, one of A ways or in one of B other ways, and where none of the set of A ways or the set of B ways um, overlaps, then there are A plus way, A ways to do the task. So let's look at some tasks. It, it always helps to map it to something legitimate. Okay, so here's an example. The CS department, so computer science department, is going to choose a student or a faculty member. And here's a big, there's an or. And stu um, as a representative to sit on a university committee. We do this all the time. So how many choices are there for this representative if there are 44 faculty members and 110 students in computer science and no one is both a faculty member and a student. That's important. So that means that I have 44 ways to choose a faculty member, right? I have 110 ways to choose a student. And if I'm choosing a student, I'm not accidentally overcounting because I'm, I'm either choosing a student or a faculty member. And together, that's how I'm going to choose my representative for this committee. Okay, so Adam's already got us, um, and in fact, by the sum rule, he's absolutely right. It follows that there are 44 plus 110, or 154, possible ways to pick that representative. So essentially what that looks like is I've got my universe, and I've got a set A, and I've got a set B, And they don't overlap, right? There's nothing in their um, intersection, okay? And so the goal was that I'm going to pick a faculty member or I'm going to pick a student, and I don't have to worry that I'm overcounting in any way. And so uh, we've got two sets that are disjoint, 
And what I'm saying is that if I want to know how many elements are in the union, if I want to pick from one or the other, I just sum those up. Okay, and we'll, later we're going to look at what happens if they do intersect. Uh, but for right now, the sum is the sort of safest rule to apply. Okay, suppose that we've got labels. I'm going to put labels on, I don't know, cans in my shop. And it will either be a single letter or it's going to be a letter followed by a number. That's a nine. Okay. If I ask you to find the number of possible labels, well, either it's, it's going to be a single letter, which I can count. And this is different than if it's a, a letter and a number. They don't overlap. So how many ways can I choose a letter? Yeah, 26 loop, that was fast. Um, so there's 26 ways and and for the second, if this is, has to apply the product rule because now I'm choosing a letter and then I'm choosing a number. And so in this one, it's 26 times 10. Um, and so we're going to combine the sum rule and the product rule. And oftentimes you're going to do that in, in solutions. And so in this case, it's 26 plus 26 times 10 or 26 plus 260, which is 286. Uh, yeah. Oh, good question. Um, in the assignment, I'm specific with uh, capital loops or not. I, I didn't say, but I was treating all letters the same. Okay, so we've done the product rule. We've done the sum rule, and now we're getting to the subtraction rule. So this is very related to the sum rule. And in fact, in some ways you can almost disregard it and just say, oh, it's the subtraction rule is a sum rule when there's an overlap between the two possible ways. Um, and you'll see what I mean by saying it, it almost <laughs> is, is, okay. Anyway, I'll show you it in a moment. If a task can be done in one of A ways, or in one of B ways. So that looks a lot like what we just saw, but I'm not putting that caveat that none of the ways overlap. So if it, you can do it in one of those two ways and we know the count of the number of ways for each, then the total number of ways to do a task is A plus B. Okay, that's what we had with the sum rule. And here's the big piece that's the add-on. Minus the number of ways um, to do the task that are common to the two different ways. So that piece was missing from the sum rule and that's because we already guaranteed that there was no ways in common, right? And so what we see is um, in sets, if we want A union B, um, then this is still that sum rule A plus B, but you have to take away all the ways that they share in common. So if over here I've got my set A and my set B, and this we came up with on our own um, in the last class, okay? We said, yeah, I want to count all the all the ways that I can do it, um, all the A ways that I can do this, and then I'm going to also count all the B ways, but uh-oh, I have overcounted this, this piece in the middle. And so I'm going to have to subtract one of those so that I get back to the actual count. Okay, so an example, um, we already counted bit strings, um, but what if we wanna count bit strings, and again, of length eight, which we said, oh, length eight, I know this, that was two to the eighth. Um, we already got that answer. Um, but, oh, wait, we want um, to start with a one bit or end with two bits, zero, zero. Okay. So um, we're going to use the subtraction rule. Okay, so first of all, what are the number of bit strings of length eight that start with a one bit? So it's going to start with a one bit. So the one is fixed. Yeah, nice, I see Burnley. Um, but actually, I'm gonna make it simpler. Just assume this, okay? So I know it's gonna start with a one, so I don't have a choice 
for that. Well, I do have a choice, but, but I only have one choice. It's going to be a one, right? So Trent, perfect. And, and I think a few others before you, but you're the last one I saw. Um, I have two to the seventh choices there, don't I? So that's 128 choices I have here. So now the next question is, what about the number of bit strings of length eight that end in zero, zero? So now I'm fixing these two. I have one choice for each of those. Yeah, so now I only get to choose uh, this other side, and there are only six of those. So I have two to the six, well spotted, or 64 choices. And then I say, okay, well, um, essentially I've got, I'm asking about um, all the ones that either end in zero, zero, so they look like zero, zero, or they start with a one, right? But some of them in here, these start with a one and then they end in a zero, zero, don't they? So I am overcounting, those do exist. So I have to figure out how do, how do I remove this bit from my counting? So the number of bits of length eight that start with a one and end with a zero, zero. So I'm fixing the one, I'm fixing the zero, zero, and now I only have to make choices in here. I'm making choices the whole time, but I'm saying the first one's going to be a one. There's one choice. So what do I have for this? One, two, three, four, five choices I'm making. Mm -hmm. So I have two to the fifth. And so putting this all together, that means I had two to the seventh choices over here, two to the six choices in here, and in the middle, I had two to the five. And that is illegible, but down here we'll see that that's 128 plus 64 minus the 32 in the overlap. So that's my overlap, two to the fifth. Okay, so we can combine rules to solve complex problems, right? Each user on a computer system has a password. That password is four to six characters long where each character is an uppercase letter. Okay, there I got specific, I don't remember who asked, I think it was Adam, but it was a good question. Uppercase letter or a digit, unless specified, letters are treated the same. Each password must contain at least one digit. Okay, so how many possible words are there? Uh, how many possible passwords, sorry, are there? So. First of all, I'll give us some nomenclature. We'll let P be the total number of passwords and P4, P5, P6 be the passwords of length four, five, and six. So then we say, okay, well, I'm looking, I want P to be the total number of passwords, right? What can you tell me about that with respect to these things? Um, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to make it harder than, I don't mean to take a huge step yet. So by the sum rule, if I knew, yeah, Sumak, uh, so Daniel, well spotted. Um, and so here, thank you. Um, so by the sum rule, P is equal to P4 plus P, P5 plus P6, right? We can break it down into the steps of figuring out how many legitimate, um, four character passwords exist, how many five character passwords exist, how many six character passwords exist. And this is that breaking it down. If I was creating a program to generate those, I would do the same thing, right? Breaking our problem down into smaller pieces. Okay, so then to find each of those, how many four character passwords, five character passwords, six character passwords are there, um, we find the number of passwords of that specific, specified length composed of letters and digits, and subtract the number composed only of letters, right? That's where I get at at least one digit. So you could play with if the digit, if there has to, you fix a digit in one location, you fix a digit in the second location, you fix a digit in the third, you can do that. It's a lot more work. Um, the trick here is to just say, I'm gonna find them all, and then I'm gonna, get rid of anything that that only contains letters and that's easier okay so 
the way that I can do that is as follows. Um, for um, oh shoot, I didn't realize how late it was. Sorry. Um, so you've got a four character password step through this one. How many ways are there to combine to choose a digit or a letter for all of them? It's A to Z plus zero to nine, right? There are 26 letters, 10 numbers. So for each of those slots, I could choose one of 36 ways, right? 30, so that's 36 times 36 times 36 times 36 or 36 to the four ways. I think you see here. And, and I'm gonna subtract the, the number of those composed only of letters. And the way that I can choose those is 26 times 26 times 26 times 26. If I chose only letters in, in each of those four spaces, that gives me the piece that I'm subtracting. And so this, um, you can step through that calculation, but the same is true as I increase the number of characters in my password. Um, and so consequently, we get something that looks like this. There's over a billion, there's almost two billion um, different possible passwords just involving uh, letters and numbers, all of letters of the same case within four to six character passwords, which is why you can see that as we increase the password length that, uh, that we, we um, wish to consider and we increase the number of symbols that are allowed in passwords, it adds a layer of security. If somebody's trying to look through my pass, the possible passwords that we could use, the sheer number of them increases as we increase um, what's allowed to be included in the, the length of those. Okay, so final rule. Um, and this one reads the worst, to be honest. Uh, I'm not loving the way that it's, it's laid out, um, but it will make sense once we apply it. Okay, so if um, there are n over d ways to do a task, if, so that's like the answer. <laughs> if it can be done using a procedure um, that can be carried out in n ways, and for every way, exactly d of the n ways correspond to that way. Okay, so it means um, if I can, if I look at um, a way to do a set of tasks and um, exactly um, a fraction of those uh, map to one thing. We'll see an example in a second. So, but I want to give it to sets. So if you have a finite set A, finite number of elements, um, and it's a union of n pairwise disjoint subsets. What does that mean? So it's got a bunch of subsets and they don't share um, between them, all none of the pairs share anything. That means if, if I were gonna draw this, they each have D elements in them and there's no overlap between any of the pairs. They're pairwise disjoint. For two sets to be disjoint, that means there's nothing in their intersection. And pairwise means if I look at any two pairs within that, uh, they don't share anything. So I can break it down into subsets, all containing D elements. Then the number of the number N, um, Oh, sorry, they're n of those little subsets. Then the size of set A is equal to n times d, right? There's n subsets equal, each containing d elements. Then it's easier, I think it's easier to see it like this. A is equal to n times d. But n is equal to the size of the set divided by d, right? That's how many... Um, Sets we have. We want something to get anyway. That's not the one I'm trying to read. Let's. We'll see what's going to be in those sets in a second, Brayden. It could be integers. Um, you'll make use of this in a bit. Okay. So the other thing can be true if we have a function, 
And again, this is sets to sets. Like, I think hopefully now that we're seeing sets and functions together, you're starting to see more of the connection. The domain and the codomain are sets. We're just choosing elements in the set. When we choose a function, we're saying, I'm going to pick elements in the domain. I'm going to map them to um, some element within the set, the codomain. Um, and so if we have a function from A to B, where both A and B are finite sets, so I've got a set A, I've got a set B, they're both finite. Um, and for every value B in B, there are exactly D values in A. So there's a set in here with a bunch of A's, and the size of that is D. There are D things that map to that value B. Okay. What can this look like? Well, the function can be a lot of things. So one of the big things that comes to mind for me is modular arithmetic. Okay, if I take something like, um, you know, mod 10, well, there's only, there's a finite set over here, zero to nine, that it's gonna map, that function's mapping things to, right? And if I take a set of numbers, then I know that every 10th element is going to zero. Every 10th element is going to one. Every 10th element is going um, to two, etc. Okay, so this is an example of of what this could be going to. Um, so I actually think, so let's take a look. Uh, this is kind of an uh, on odd one. Let me, let me see if I can go to, hold on. Oh, I don't have, okay, it's okay. Um, I actually like that example that I was just thinking about there uh, more, but let's say, okay, so how many ways are there to see four people around a circular table where um, two seatings are considered the same when each person has the same left and right hand neighbor. Okay, so I've got a seat. Here's my table. Four people around a, a circular table. So this doesn't, yeah. So I want you to think about that for a second. So let's label the seats um, uh, one to four. One, two, three, four, okay? So how many ways, so when I've got persons A, B, C, and D. And so how many ways can I choose somebody for seat one? Yeah, four. I like that exclamation point question mark. I wasn't sure how to take that. I don't know if that's a question or you're darn sure of it. Um, but either way, I think I like it. Okay, so there's four ways to choose uh, someone for seat one. How many ways are there to choose someone for seat two? Okay, and how many ways are there to choose for seat three? I feel like the answer is coming to. And finally, there's no choice for seat one. So then the question is, okay, well, there are, um, that's all fine and good. Um, so there, so I think then what we're saying is to, to do that, that first time, um, that's four times three times two times one, or as someone said, um, I can see it pop up, but I didn't catch the name, four factorial, yeah. Um, so there are 24 ways to order those four people. But I also said that seatings are the same if, if I set up with someone, the same person on my left and my right. So now, I, I'm, I'm over counting in some way here, aren't I? Two seatings are the same when each person has the same left and the right person for every, um, right? So am I over counting in some way? And you can, 
play it out. Think about it. So I guess the question is, am I overcounting? Yeah, there's overcounting. In fact, yeah, um, it depends. Okay, let's take a look at uh, what is later claimed to be bad English. Um, it depends on if we count if sitting different positions as difference doesn't sit up in. Yes, it's, so uh, order doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, it's it's yeah. we're considering well. Okay, I was gonna say well said um, in response to to phrasing bad English, but um, essentially what what I believe is being said is. Does, does the positioning of the table matter? Like if I have an ocean view, is that different than if I'm looking at the wall? In this example, no. So um, we're in a square room with no windows. Uh, it's all bad. Um, <laughs> order doesn't matter. It's just who you're, the only win is who you're seated next to. Yes, so Kuhn has spotted this. Um, great, ex great answer. Um, essentially what happens is no matter how I choose that seat one, I'm, uh, I'm getting an overcounting because they're kind of all the same. You, you're, you're just shifted a little bit, right? And so since two seatings are the same, uh, when each person has this, the same person on the left and the right, then for every, every choice for seat one is basically get the same cluster of, of settings. And so we're always coming back to that same mapping. And so we get the same seating. And so we have to actually divide by four. There are 24, four factorial over four, as I think Kuhn said, uh, or six different arrangements. And you can play with this. This is a small enough example. So I wanted to choose something that you could actually map it out and see that there's a translation. Uh, but the other piece that you can look at, um, and this is why I said, oh, well, I, I wish I had uh, also used this example, is when you use modular arithmetic. Because if I take, I'll come to it at the end. Um, I want to get through this and I see it's 947. Okay, so we can solve uh, many counting problems just using something really trivial, which is a tree diagram. And in fact, even in combinatorial game theory, the first thing that one does is it looks at um, the game tree, um, which is a physical drawing, a representation of what the choices are uh, within various games. Um, and so here's a, a tree diagram can be applied in a lot of different counting problems. Uh, and in this case, a branch um, represents a possible choice and the leaves represent possible outcomes. Okay, so let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, we'll draw a nice tree for this particular one. Um, so suppose that you really wanted an I love discrete math t-shirt. Um, and so, I definitely have to stock those at the bookstore for you. And I'm gonna make sure they come in four different sizes, small, medium, large, and extra large. And we're gonna have them each come in three different colors, red, green, and blue, RGB, why not? Um, and, oh, except, um, unfortunately, the supplier that we have does only, it doesn't have blue in our extra large. And so extra large will come in red and green. So what is the minimum number of shirts that the campus bookstore needs to stock in order to have one of each size and color available? Okay, well, I'm sure that you can apply, I know that you can apply the product rule, the sum rule, um, and get to this answer, that's okay. Um, uh, but another possible solution is just to draw out a diagram. And sometimes, and now this is a simple example, but there are times that this makes sense. Um, okay, so one way that you could do that um, in this case is you're saying, okay, well, first I have to choose a size. Okay, so as if we go back, you'll see that what we said was a branch is going to represent a choice. So 
So first we have a starting point, which is nothing, and then the outcome is, is where we're going to end. Okay, so we're going to start here, and the first choice that we're going to make is uh, sizes. Okay, so I have four choices to make there. I'm going to either choose small, it comes in medium, it comes in large, and it comes in extra large. Okay, so these are the nodes that I'm going out to. And then for each of those, um, I have more choices to make, right? So I have, in fact, three choices, um, red, green, blue, three choices, red, green, blue. And for large, I have three choices, red, green, blue. You'll have to trust me that some of those letters are what they seem. And then finally, for extra large, um, I only have uh, red and green. I don't have an option to blue. And so if I list out what they have to have, they need red and green, very like Christmas colors, there we go. Um, and so the possible outcomes are all of these things down on that lower edge. And so how many t-shirts? It's a counting problem. The combination that I'm looking at is is those that are, I can buy, I should have a small red, a small green, a small blue, a medium red, medium green, medium blue, a large red, large green, large blue, an extra large red, and an extra large green. Okay? So this is um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So I need 11 different t-shirts in stock at the bookstore so that you can all buy your I Love Discrete Math t-shirt which does not exist, I'm sorry to say. If there's a big run on it, let me know. <laughs> okay, embarrassed to even suggest that. Uh, all right, so that's the counting piece. Um, we have four minutes. I'm gonna kill uh, that for a second. Open up the whiteboard. <laughs> Shelly, awesome, I'm so proud. I'm going to stop the show. And then I'm going to just point out one other way. Um, all right. So then the last piece is sometimes uh, we can use the division. Somebody was sort of question of where can you apply that. Um, the other piece is if you have a set of, of numbers. So if I've, I have the numbers, um, um, Ten to twenty. Uh, ten to something more than that. Uh, ten to let's go to thirty. And I have a function um, which is mod ten, right? All of those things are mapped to the number zero to nine. And in fact, I know that I'm gonna take and divide these up in such a way that an exact fraction is going um, over uh, to zero, right? Like uh, 10 is going to go to zero, um, 20 is going to go to, actually let's go to 29, so it's an exact fraction, to 29. I have two of those elements will go to zero, exactly two will go to um, so it'll be 10 and 20 are going to go to 0, and 11 and 21 are going to go to 1, and 12 and 22 are going to go to 2, and so on. So I can break this up into exactly 9 subsets that map over to this other function, right? And so, uh, yeah. So if I was trying to count the number of elements in that set, so there were, uh, this started off with 20 elements in here. There were 20 numbers to begin with. Uh, so, so they're not going to nine. They're going to 10 different options over here. And, uh, and so if I wanted to count the number of elements that go from, um, so x mod 10, 
I wanted all the ones that were equal to, say, 3, well, that's going to be 20 divided by 10 or 2. Because we know that. So in this example, I can count them. But if I was saying, how many numbers are there mod 3 or mod 10 that are equal to 3 um, in the numbers zero, you know, 1 through a billion, counting that by hand is not as easy as saying, oh, it's going to be the number uh, 13 and 23. Right here, I can exhaustively list them. I can check them all. Um, but sometimes we're looking at bigger numbers. And so for that reason, um, this is another great place that we might use that division rule.